I want to be able to stabilize my income without having to working. I enjoy working, but nonetheless, I want to be at that point. So for me, that looks like cash flowing rentals. If you were just straight up asking me as a friend at a networking group, you know, should I buy this? Here in my market, I'd be like, yeah, man, it's a good investment. You know, it's going to be hard to lose money. What is up, YouTube? Matt McKeever here. This is the inaugural episode of Deal Destruction. I'm really excited. And so Deal Destruction is a brand new show to my YouTube channel. So let's kind of set the framework for what this is all about. I find that there's a ton of real estate investors out there, or I should say aspiring real estate investors that get lost in analysis paralysis because they're never sure of whether they should buy a deal or pass on a deal or how they can go about tweaking the terms of that deal to really make it work for them their goals and their business model. So deal destruction is all about diving deep into the deal analysis. This is going to be a no holds bar. So I'm going to be very open, very transparent, and very honest about what my thoughts are in regards to this deal and what the guests, you know, plans are in regards to this deal and how realistic that is. And again, this is really just about getting right into the numbers. We're not going to have any fancy spreadsheets. There's going to be no complicated analysis. Any spreadsheet analysis we do, I will literally build live on this call to show everyone that deal analysis is actually quite simple as long as you understand what you're trying to accomplish. So in today's episode, I've got John Joyce here. Hey, John, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Appreciate you being the uh, very first guinea pig on deal destruction. So if you don't mind, share with the audience just what's your real estate experience to date? So I have no real estate experience whatsoever. Uh, I have zero properties to my name. I am 19 years old, and I've just been religiously watching Matt McKeever videos, Graham Stephan videos, and Bigger Pocket videos for about two years now, and just doing everything in my power to facilitate the first deal. Awesome, John. I love the hustle, and I wish I was seriously looking at real estate at 19. So what's the goal with this property? What are you hoping to accomplish? So this is more or less just going to be the foundation for future deals that I have. For me, this is like you've always talked about, just getting that first deal. Even if it's not the best thing you ever had, just getting one under your belt. So for me, it's going to be an owner occupied. It's going to be a little bit of a, a little bit of a burr. You know, we have the increased value add potential on it, but ultimately it's just supposed to be a regular rental. Uh, if I can pull money out of the next deal, I'll, I'll be excited. That'll just be icing on the cake. Awesome. All right. And so just to give the audience some context, John wrote down a basic description of this deal. So I'll rhyme it off now here for everyone, and then we'll dive deep into the analysis. <clears throat> so this is a two-family property, short sale, on the market a year. List price is two forty. dollars ARV is $285,000 plus. Gross max rents are $25 to $2,700 a month. The work needed in total is about $15,000 to $20,000. The cost to purchase with FHA at 3.5% down and get rent ready is going to be $16,000. Then the renovations. Price offered was 197. So the price John has offered was 197 on the 240 list price. And we're going to be diving into this deal. So uh, John shared the address with me quick. So I'm just going to pull up uh, on screen here the Redfin. And uh, we'll take a quick look at that. But unfortunately, they've actually kind of pulled a bunch of the information on us. So we can't see a ton, but at least I can see a basic uh, outline of the property. So it looks like you know, you're one and a half, two story uh, with a garage, um, decent sized parking lot. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have any other uh, photos, but it looks like it's also either nicely sided or is that brick? I can't actually tell. It's regular wood siding. Gotcha. Okay. Americans and wood siding. You guys are crazy. <laughs> we don't have that too often in Canada. Um, all right. And then otherwise, I just pulled it up on a map to get a little bit of perspective because I personally didn't know where Tauntaun was. Um, and uh, I'm still not sure I could find my way there if I had to, but I can see it's kind of a little bit in between Boston, Providence, and this is in Massachusetts, right? Yeah, Massachusetts. Awesome. All right. I've got my spreadsheet up, but maybe before we get into the spreadsheet, what else should I know about this property, John, or what's your general thoughts on it? Uh, so actually minor added the cost to get rent ready. I would actually add another 5,000 of that. We got to stick in the spokes and realize an extra fee. So that 16 is actually going to be 21. 
So one edit there. Uh, okay. But just thoughts on the property is, well, I, I don't really know. All right. So let's, let's redefine what success would look like for you. So again, starting off as a brand new investor, I can appreciate the desire just to get a deal under your belt and really use that as your school of hard knocks, right? A lot of people are very comfortable um, investing tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in a post-secondary education, which may or may not pay off. To me, investing that money into your first deal and learning through the school of hard knocks and hands-on, I think can be a fantastic education. For myself, the biggest thing is just really trying to dial in what success looks like. And one of the biggest struggles I find with most investors, especially newer investors, is they don't have a clear definition of success or a win. And so because they don't have a clear definition of success, it's very difficult for them to know whether to pull the trigger or what terms or conditions they need to tweak. Um, so I guess you're looking at this as a house hack. Um, so you're going to live in one unit, rent out the other unit. So a lot of investors I know would define a successful house hack as being able to live for free. Would that kind of align within your goal here? Or what would, what's your goal from a house hack perspective look like? For me, I just plan to live here for the minimum of one year. I might go over by a little bit, but ultimately I just want to live in there for as little time as possible, move out, get it rented and have it start cash flowing. I may enjoy living in the house a little bit and stay there longer. It depends on how quickly I can get the second house under my belt. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately I plan to live in the house for a shorter period of time as possible and get out. This isn't and then, going to be forever. And then once you move out, how would you define success after that? Is there a certain cash flow per unit, a certain cash on cash return you know what are the key metrics that john's going to use to decide what to buy the next property as for me it's not so much the means as it is the ends for me it's i want to get to a point where i don't have to be in any specific job i can do whatever life develops to be necessary i don't have to you know make this amount every month to be able to survive i want to be able to stabilize my income without having to working I enjoy working, but nonetheless, I want to be at that point. So for me, that looks like cash flowing rentals. I don't necessarily have a, a certain guideline per unit just yet. Okay. As Could we, we outline how much cash per month would you need in order to not have a job? I would say probably around 5,000 a month. 5,000 a month. Okay. And um, based upon this property, we were looking at buying it for around 197,000. Um, we were going to be spending about, would you say 15, 20,000? What number do you want to use as kind of a placeholder here for rentals? So to get it rent ready would be 21,000. And then we have some other costs just to get it to, for the value add, so to speak. Okay. And what are those costs for the, is that including the 21,000, the value add or that's separate? That's separate. Okay. And what's that look like? That would probably come in somewhere around 20,000, 20, 25,000. Okay, so we're looking at potentially paying, paying about 46,000 in total rentals here. Yeah, that's about fair. And then once the property is fixed up, what do you expect the uh, fair market value of the property to be? Right now we found comparables from anywhere at uh, 270 to 320. Some of the comparables are a little bit different than ours, so we're putting that anywhere between about 200, uh, 270 and 300. Okay. Uh, in and, between two and five. And when you're looking at comparables, how exactly, what sort of definition of comparables are you using? Are you using like a certain time restriction? Like, is it since COVID? Is it just the last year? If I remember correctly, my realtor pulled them based off one year, two mile radius, and all of them are two families, two bedroom, two baths, or sorry, two bedroom, one baths each unit. So as close as we could get to the house. So four bed, two baths for the house. Okay. Comparable baths and bids. All right. Yeah, I like what you guys are doing. The only one, and again, I don't know what your local market's like, John. Um, the one thing that I'm really pushing my wholesalers on these days is trying to really focus only on recent comps, just because we find the market to be so choppy since COVID happened. There are certain pockets and cities that seem to have ignored COVID altogether. There's other ones that seem to have really slowed down from a sales volume perspective and sometimes even starting to see a bit of weakness in regards to pricing. Other markets seem just as hot as ever here in Canada. Obviously, real estate's all about location, location, location. So you kind of have to depend upon your local experts there. So if your realtor is saying one year is good, um, I probably would be fine with that. Two mile radius, 
sounds big to me, but again, I don't necessarily know this market like the back of my hand. So how big of a city is Tauntaun in the first place? Uh, I want to say the population's around 40, 50,000. Uh, it's actually largest square mileage in mass, uh, but it's a decent sized city. Uh, two miles, a little bit of a stretch, but that was just so we could get as many comparables as possible. The ones that came in that were really close price-wise to what I gave you were very close. One across the street is actually okay. the 285. It's a four bedroom, two bath. Everything's fixed up and it sold for 285 a year ago. As for my market, uh, I actually asked my realtor too. I was curious what COVID had done to the market. And she said, you know, there was a slight blip for a little bit where people stopped buying, but that was probably March, April-ish. And our June sales were like 120% of what they were this time last year. And it was just nonstop. I've been okay. watching it. Things have been flying off the shelves. So we're booming afterwards. I love the data, man. That's awesome. Um, Cause yeah, when I'm looking here, you can see the map, right? That yep. I've got up right now. Yeah. yeah. Cause certainly, you know, again, uh, because I'm in Canada, Google Maps scale right here at the bottom is going to be in meters, but I can see roughly 200 meters. If I had to guess, it looks like this street is about 200 meters. So when yeah. I think of a two mile radius, you're probably almost out to here, right? And that feels like it's taking a lot of area into consideration. So I know yeah. for me, you know, I would really be focusing on this core area, right? Like ideally the stuff within yep. what I would consider like a 500 uh, to a thousand meter radius. And again, we're obviously going to be looking very much for a uh, style of construction and things of that nature. So, you know, these look like relatively older homes. This actually looks very sim similar to uh, my market here in Canada. The only real difference is like that wood siding would all be vinyl siding here. Um, yep. But yeah, like all these houses look to be, you know, similar style, similar type of construction. That's a beast of a house. Um, so yeah, actually a funny thing about this location, you're talking about, you know, square mileage and how to base the comps. So yeah. in your aerial view that you had before, you mm -hmm. were looking at that region to the left. That's actually, I guess you would say a strong rental market in my town. There's, there's a couple of pocket areas that all have their own dynamics. My father's a landlord in Taunton, so I, I definitely know the rental markets very well. That is basically, it's all three families and up. It is just completely rentals. It's lower income kind of shitty area in some ways sure. too. Uh, what's good about this property is it's priced as a result of those comparables to the left. But if you actually compare it to a lot of the other, I guess you would say similar regions outside of this radius, which is actually what it's respective of, it is a much, much nicer location, but the price is driven down by other people uh, per, you know, those home prices, but the rents are up there, right on that street. That main road right there yep. is what keeps it from being a terrible area. That little side street that you're walking down in that uh, mm -hmm. street view is super nice. And it's nothing like that rental market over the left. So my market rents that I was able to pull through Rentometer were based off over there, and that's where the... Uh, 24 2500 range is coming from yeah and so speaking about that 2400 kind of 2500 uh gross rent range again like i naturally like that from the outset because using the one percent rule it gives me a quick indication that i i'd expect pretty strong cash flow here is the property like separate metered as in tenants pay for their own uh hydro uh, water's not separate. Electric is separate, except the garage is actually on the tenant unit that I plan on renting. So that's one minor fix within that 21,000 figure that I gave you. Uh, so electric will be metered. Uh, heat is all separate, so on and so forth. Okay, cool. And if I understand correctly in the States, usually it's actually a 75% loan to value that you guys get on refinances for uh, investment properties. Is that correct? Uh, I would say 80. Oh, it is 80. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, we're usually able to do 80 here as well. So from that perspective, if we were trying to do a perfect burr, right, it, it sounds like we'd be aiming in the low 300 range for where we'd want our appraisal at. Um, in order for you to get all your money out. And based upon the comps, it sounds like you're going to be in the right ballpark, right? Worst case scenario, maybe you end up getting an appraisal at 270, 280. You've got 20 or $30,000 tied up into the property, but then you'll have a decent cash flowing property. Um, 
based upon the general expenses you would incur here in Canada, I'd probably expect this property to cash flow about $200 a month per unit. And that would be factoring in a realistic repairs and maintenance budget, a vacancy, bad debt, and property management. Do you want to get control of your financial life? Do you want to crush it in real estate with wholesaling? Do you want to join my full-time team of wholesalers like Mike or Shahir? Or what about Tyler or Diego? Or what about Amar? All right, and what do we do, boys? We, we make offers, we buy fast. Never gonna miss a deal because we pay cash. Offers, 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 deals, deals, deals. Tell us, Mr. Seller, what, what price do you feel? Because we're Southwestern's biggest source of deals. Boom. So if you guys want to crush it with wholesaling, you need to join my team. And down below, video description, there's all the links you need. Based upon the general expenses you would incur here in Canada, I'd probably expect this property to cash flow about $200 a month per unit. And that would be factoring in a realistic repairs and maintenance budget, a vacancy, bad debt, and property management. Um, what sort of cash flow numbers are you looking at based upon the numbers you're running? When I ran my numbers, I was getting around 400 a month cash flow if both units are rented out and not living there. Uh, another thing to factor in, which I know, I know what you're going to say about this, but I don't plan on property managing my properties unless I get, unless I get to the Matt McKeever point where I have so many units, I can't handle it anymore. I, I thoroughly plan to landlord my own properties, at least until I hit like the 15 to 20 unit range. Sure. And I can definitely respect that. And what's nice is here, you've got enough margin um, in your cash flow numbers that you can easily absorb that without it. Uh, negatively impacting you. I definitely would say every single person always has to run their numbers as if they're going to do property management, especially for you, John, at such a young age, like, you know, 19 years old, even if you just accidentally keep investing in real estate, you're going to build up a pretty robust portfolio over the next few decades. And that's if you decide not to go hard on it. And just even based upon the language you're using and the amount of research you've already done, I would suspect that you probably will at some time uh, decide to go really hard on real estate investing. So uh, I think we've maybe talked about this in the past, but just in case anyone watching this right now doesn't know it, these are three sets of expenses that I include in every analysis that I find most uh, investors, real estate uh, agents, and just a lot of other uh, um, individuals will ignore. So property management, I like using 10%. Now, usually that's actually going to factor in 8% uh, for property management, 1% for snow removal, and 1% for uh, lawn maintenance. And seeing how you're still um, fairly north, I'm going to guess snow removal is a cost you got to worry about as well. Then I use 5% as bad debt and vacancy. Um, and again, when you're young, especially your first property, John, you're probably never going to have vacancy or bad debt if you're like me. You're just going to watch it like a hawk and you'll just be on top of that shit. You'll get perfect tenants in there and everything will work like clockwork until you start scaling your portfolio. And that's where then vacancies and bad debt start happening. Because once you're in the point where you're juggling 10 or 15 units, that's when you start to really like, like, oh man, I just literally don't have time to rent it out today. Like I'm just going to have to wait a month in order for me to get all my other stuff ready. So we've got 10% property management fee, 5% bad debt and vacancy and 5% repairs and maintenance. Um, so, Normally, again, I don't know if you factored in any of these into your initial expenses, but if we were to take them based upon my numbers, in essence, what we're going to end up with, right, is about, uh, what's this work out to, $480 in total expenses. Or if we were to prorate this on a per unit basis, you know, about $200, $250 per unit, which, you know, you said $400 a month in cash flow, I guess $200. Once we factor in property management, bad debt and repairs and maintenance, I bet we probably land close to the same number unless you had already factored in bad debt or repairs and maintenance. What is bad debt that you're saying? So bad debt is like someone doesn't pay you. So like he technically owes you the rent, but he just never pays you. Here in Ontario, I'd have to hire a sheriff to go evict him. The sheriff evicts him and I can try and chase him in small claims court, but I'm realistically never going to get paid. So that's a bad debt. And so eventually you're going to end up writing off that bad debt. So very common term in like a lot of uh, businesses. It's not necessarily a term you're going to hear a lot of landlords use unless they're more on the investment side, like where they're really starting to treat it like a business. 
at that point in time, it's important that uh, we just factor in all these different costs. So sounds like we're actually pretty much on the same page. So I think my biggest issue here, John, is honestly just going to be determining what is a win for you, right? Because, you know, you're actually pretty fluid here. You know, you're pretty pretty reasonable guy, you've got pretty reasonable expectations. If the big goal is at some point in time, I want to make $5,000 a month from real estate investing. Well, based upon these numbers, even if we end up taking my numbers net uh, or like take your numbers and then net these expenses here, we'd still be looking at just under uh, $400 a month in gross rents. Um, I think we'd be at, if we assumed 800 minus uh, the expenses above, we'd be at like 320 a month in uh, gross rents, or sorry, not gross rents, uh, net income. And so for that uh, net income, again, you know, if we take this on the basis of uh, what you're getting per unit, you're just going to be under uh, $200 a month, so 160. If we take the 5,000, uh, if we take the 5,000 a month that you want to make divide by 160, uh, we're going to come out to, you need about 31 units, right? So one of the things I guess I would take into consideration under your set of circumstances is, you know, how achievable does that feel? You know, does that feel like something that you could put together in the next few years? Is that a timeline that you like in regards to, you know, making it to your $5,000 goal? Um, because all this seems very reasonable to me, you know, 19 year old Matt, I would have been really happy had he bought a property like this because you should be able to essentially live in the property for free or almost free. Um, if our gross rents are 24, 2,500 a month, you expect to cash flow 800 before uh, kind of these expenses here. That means that like out of pocket, you know, you're really not going to be out of pocket much money in order to live there, right? You're essentially going to kind of be break even from a living perspective while you live in the property. And then one year time, you can move out, buy the next property, rent this out, should cash flow well. Um, so yeah, I guess last thing that maybe we should talk about is the, these renos. How confident are you in this? What does that $21,000 do? So the 21,000 is, you know, down payment, every other cost associated with closing on the house, getting things done that I need to get a rent ready and just the bare minimum to make everything operate. And then the value add is those things of the property that don't need to be done right away, but can be done in time to, you know, gotcha. increase. So tenants. if we subtract the down payment out of this 21,000, because that's technically included in our purchase price, what should this actually be? Let's see. So are you trying to separate uh, my physical cash in from the finance yeah, side? Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what my total cost of the property is, right? So if, for example, the 21000 includes your closing costs plus your down payment, I would just want to know what the down payment amount is so I can subtract it. Yeah, let's see. So my down payment would be 7000 closing costs would be 4200 So those two are getting financed. The rest of that's out of pocket. Okay, so about 11000 out of pocket. Okay. So 11,000 in new costs. Um, so realistically you even just need to kind of appraise around 290 then in order to have a prefer here. Um, so that seems very plausible. Um, so the 25,000, what's that then the value add? What is that? Yeah. What's so like what renovations? With, yep. That's replacing the siding on the property, the windows. You have a couple of other, uh, we had some stuff we want to do the garage to make that rentable as well. Not as a unit, but as a car rental. Yep. So that's part of the increasing rents up to, you know, the 2,700 range. Uh, so that, that's all included in that. Okay. And have you had like quotes done? Is this based upon like experience of friends and family? How did you go about figuring out the 25? So one route that I went to get that 25,000 figure was my father because he's dealt with all that stuff. I have an investor friend uh, from out of town, a couple towns away, owns some 25, 30 units. I asked him what he thought too. Same price as my dad gave me. I was looking at something like 7,500, 10,000 for the siding, another 10,000 for the windows, and then 5,000 miscellaneous stuff. All right. Sounds good, man. I like it. You've got your numbers covered. So yeah, I think legit, man, to me, the biggest thing is just, you know, 
for you to have a lot of confidence going forward, I would suspect that just having a very clear definition of what a good deal is. So for example, a lot of the coaching clients that I coach in regards to real estate investing, one of the first things we do, right, is start off with that big goal. So in your case, it's $5,000 a month in cash flow is my big goal. Then what we start parsing out for that individual is focusing on, okay, well, you know, what are current investment opportunities you see or what would a realistic current investment opportunity look like? In your case, that's going to be, you know, two to $400 a month in cash flow per unit seems to be pretty achievable based upon the numbers we saw. So then what I would naturally do is divide that into the 5,000 to figure out how many units. Then we figure out how impatient you are, reverse engineer those steps and roll out from that. And the reason that's so important for a lot of the people that I coach is because they come across opportunities all the time to invest. And so, you know, tomorrow, maybe they're going to get an email um, from a wholesaler that's like, great opportunity to wholetail or flip this property and make $25,000 in profit. And that sounds pretty cool. Should you just drop everything and go chase that $25,000? And then the day after that, maybe you're going to get an email um, again that's like, hey, great cash flow in property. Cash flow is $150 a month per unit after all expenses. Again, doesn't sound bad. So like, should you go buy that one? And what ends up becoming the big struggle for them is they don't have a, a matrix to really judge their decision making on, right? Like they don't got a clear understanding of what their goals are. And because of that, it's very difficult to rank or order or sort opportunities. So the only thing that I would really encourage you on is, you know, at some point in time, and maybe it makes sense to do your first deal or two first, get your sea legs and then really commit to a big goal in the business model. Um, but that would be my biggest piece of feedback. So this is kind of disappointing because I don't get to tear apart your deal and I really wanted to that to be a part of deal destruction. But we have crossed paths before, John, and I do know you to be a organized, mature individual for a 19-year-old. So it doesn't surprise me that I didn't get to uh, destroy your deal. But if you were just straight up asking me as a friend at a networking group, you know, should I buy this? Here in my market, I'd be like, yeah, man, it's a good investment. You know, it's going to be hard to lose money. I think that that's in general important on your first investment. You know, I always like to think of Warren Buffett's first rule of investing, which is don't lose money. Uh, this property feels like it fits within that quite well because, you know, you should be able to easily burr it. Um, if for whatever reason you can't refinance and pull out your money, sounds like you could always sell it if you wanted to. Again, not that that's your primary goal. Cash flow looks strong. I agree with you that there's upside to increase the cash flow as well. So it sounds like maybe you could rent out that garage for a couple hundred bucks a month. Again, that's actually quite similar to what you could do here in my market as well. So that rings authentically true. Um, yeah, man, I think it's a personal choice at this point. So if you feel comfortable living in that neighborhood, seems like a solid investment. And uh, one of the cool things is, you know, if you live in that neighborhood, I would be, you know, driving and walking for dollars all the time. And just like meeting all those maybe C or D class tenants that are a few blocks over from you and, you know, find out which ones landlords are about to snap and just quit. Um, because some of my best opportunities have just came from getting to know the people in the community. So one of my first favorite things to do when I enter a new market is try and find a bunch of existing tenants that live in that market and let them know that I'm aggressively trying to buy in that neighborhood. And I let them know, Hey, if you introduce me to a landlord, I end up buying the property because of your introduction, I'll pay you a thousand dollar finder's fee. And you'd be surprised the number of people that all of a sudden decide to just become your bird dog. And there's like, well, I know everyone that lives in this town. So I'm just going to get all their landlords numbers. And you're like, please do, man, please do. I would love to write you giant checks. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great spot to potentially find your next property as well. If you're living there. I think so too. For all me, right, it's definitely just about the whole getting your feet wet and seeing what happens. So you've already submitted an offer on this property. All right. Yeah, so it's set it to the seller and now it's going to the bank. All right. So we're just waiting and seeing what happens. I love it. And again, great opportunity. It's been on the market for a year coming in, you know, 20% below asking seems quite reasonable based upon my basic understanding of that market. A year's a long time to sit on any real estate market. So hopefully the bank's starting to get a little bit um, motivated and interested in moving on. And uh, I think, yeah, you got some great upside. So any questions before we wrap this up, John? Uh, well, 
actually per the refinance that you're talking about, do you have any experience comparing, you know, when to do refinance and when to do a HELOC? Uh, sure. So in general, here in Canada, at least the way it works is it's going to be easier to refinance at an 80% loan to value with a refi versus a HELOC. So again, in Canada, we've got some blended products that might allow you to get up to that 80% loan to value. And so some of my favorite products we have, uh, and they're becoming more and more stingy on these. So I don't know if you've got them in the States, but if they do definitely get this. Um, in Canada, we used to have a bunch of these products where you could do an 80% loan to value refinance, and then they would give you a $1 uh, HELOC. And as you paid down your mortgage, the HELOC would grow. So the first month, let's say I make a thousand dollar mortgage payment and $500 is principal. $500 goes to paying down my mortgage, right? And then immediately my line of credit, which was $1, goes to $501. And then the next month I pay another $500 down. It keeps growing so that you're always adding 80% loan to value. As an investor, that's a fantastic product if you can find it because we're always looking to access our equity and get liquidity. Um, so that was one of my favorite things that we converted a bunch of my properties over to while they'd allow us then they kind of started restricting how many of those you could get your hands on. So I personally love that. If you can find products like that, I'd strongly encourage you to look into them. Outside of that, is it literally the exact same thing? Can you do 80% to a HELOC or 80% to the refi and it's the exact same regardless? To my knowledge, yeah. Uh, you know, I just have to learn more about how the HELOCs work and Recently, I've actually been looking at that a lot. I never thought about HELOCs. I always thought that they were poor options, so I just stuck to just the refinance. So when I was looking at this property, I was just looking at it from the 80% ARV, you know, what money can I pull out? How much do I leave in? And I realized more of how you can structure your HELOCs to actually pull out more money. Uh, mm -hmm. But still searching more into that. Yeah. So, yeah, I would definitely encourage you to talk to some local investors because I'm sure it's very state by state in the U.S. the same way it's province by province here in Canada. Um, but if you find the right product, it can be a very useful tool to have in your tool belt as an investor. Um, all right, John. Well, I think I'm going to wrap up this episode of Deal Destruction. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, just share with us your deal. Let's dive deep into it. If people want to follow along with you on your journey, can they? And if so, how's the best way to do so? Uh, well, nothing at the moment. I mean, I always open to people following me on my personal. I'm in the short to long term, going to start adding more of the real estate stuff, but I'm waiting until I'm a real investor before I do that. So let me pull up my personal Instagram and that would be jjoyce330. All right. So make sure you guys go and follow along with John if you want to see an update and uh, make sure you send me an email or DM on whether this ends up getting accepted and stuff because that'll be fun to uh, update the episode. But again, for anyone that watched this video, if you're thinking about house hacking, if you're thinking about buying your first investment property, I think the key is just having a clear set of criteria, which are going to be based upon your goal as an investor. So while John and I talked through his today, it maybe sound a little bit lax. I think the only reason it sounds that way is because John really knows what he wants already. So he's essentially looking for a 1% rule burr property that he can perfectly burr, that he can house hack and then move out in a year this property scratches all those itches. And in fact, I think there's room for some decent upside, right? Because we were really looking at the worst case from a refi perspective. Obviously, if you can get it on the higher end of that 300, that 320 range, you know, at 320, you're probably going to be walking away with at least 10 or 20 grand in your pocket, which is a really powerful spot to be in at the age 19, get all your money back plus another 20 grand and now go run off and buy another property. Um, really powerful position to be in. I love it. And no matter what, just at the age of 19, already thinking ahead like this, John, you're going to crush it. Thanks, man. Yeah. And if I lose, I win. Yeah, that's it. All right. Have a good one, man. You too. Thanks.